فعاش القلب إخلاصا وصرت تحومك الطير تحلق في ثقافات وتنهل من روب الخير Right now I'm going on stage is Mufti Ismail Menk Our brothers made it all the way from across the world, a busy shuttle. Like I told you earlier on, all the scholars here have tight shuttles. But when Nigeria comes calling, Wallahi, they are always there for us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be there for them at their point of need. May Allah support them and increase them in understanding. Please help me in welcoming Mufti Ismail Menk. May Allah ease him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh ya Shaykh. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We can try that again, inshallah. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I can't believe that there are so many people and I can barely hear the response. You want to try once more? السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, his household, his companions. We ask Allah to bless them, to bless every one of us, to grant us all goodness. My beloved brothers and sisters, primarily Allah has created us for a reason, for a purpose. If you don't understand that, you need to look at a few things. Sometimes people who don't believe ask me, well, why have we been created? How do you know that we were created in order to worship Allah, to be tested by Allah, etc., etc.? And I say, well, revelation tells us. And then they begin to say, we don't believe in revelation. So I tell them something that really gets them thinking. And that is, how long are you going to live for? How long are you going to live for? How long do you expect to be alive? And the answer is, well, maybe a hundred years. Sometimes people say 80 years. I think a good life would be what? 80? Is 80 good enough? Is 80 good enough? Wow, this is one of the driest, the driest congregations I've spoken to. Come on. I haven't known Abuja to be that bad. Come on. May Allah protect us. I know I'm speaking late in the day, but come on. You need to respond at least to make me feel like I'm speaking to people. So is 80 a good age? MashaAllah, good age. Okay. May Allah give us a hundred for as long as it's healthy and for as long as it's in the obedience of Allah. So the minute we start thinking about death, then you can ask a question. Well, do you really think this life that we have right now was all about enjoying as much as you can and then dying? Is that what you think it is? I do what I want. I say what I want. I enjoy whatever comes to my mind. I get it done. And I have a policy of your law. You only live once and I continue. And then I die and I say, wow, I did a good thing. Wow. Is that what it is? That's not what it is. I'm so sophisticated. I can feel that I am made by the deity, the supreme deity in a way that I can see, I can hear, I have feelings, emotions, I get hurt. If you cut me, I will bleed and so on. And I have relatives, those I love, perhaps those I don't get along with and so many different things. Do you really think all this complex life actually just comes to an end the minute I close my eyes and it's all over? وَقَالُوا مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحِيَا That was the statement of the disbelievers at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They used to say, well, it is only this life, you know, dead and alive. That's what it is. We will live and we will die. That's it. And there is no hereafter. There is no resurrection. There is nothing to come thereafter. My beloved brothers and sisters, we are too complicated and we are too connected and advanced for us to think for a moment that at death, everything comes to an end. May Allah guide us and grant us goodness. I start this way because if you don't understand the purpose of your life, you won't understand why ibadah and worshipping the deity who created you is so important. Allah speaks about what gives him the right to dish out instructions. It's a question people ask. 
How come the Quran just says you should do this and that? Why does the Almighty think that he has the right to decide what should happen? So Allah answers that. أَلَا لَهُ الْخَلْقُ وَالْأَمْرُ تَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ Behold, for him is the creation. It belongs to him, he created. The minute you create, you have the right to dictate. Allahu Akbar. Al-Amr is the ownership of Al-Khaliq. You need to remember that. The instruction is or belongs to the one who made, the one who created. So I know that I am created by a supreme deity. We call him Allah. He calls himself Allah. He is alone. His names and qualities none share. And to be honest, he is unique. He is irresistible. He is the one and only. He made us. He nourishes. He cherishes. He provides. He will protect. And he does protect. In his hands lies the control of entire creation, the, the smallest ant and those creatures smaller than the ants, the little atoms that are in the atmosphere, in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the droplets of water, H2O, in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surely if he made this and we are going to return to the one who made us, he has the right to tell us what we should be doing. Al-Amr is in the hands of Allah. Behold, for him is the creating and for him is the instruction. They belong to him. Subhanallah. The creation belongs to Allah. The instruction belongs to Allah. Tabarakallah. Rabbul Alameen. All praise. Glory be to Allah. The one who is the Lord of the worlds. May Allah grant us an understanding. So my beloved brothers and sisters, Allah in his divine wisdom has instructed us to engage in acts of worship. He's instructed us what to do and what not to do. And he says, if you do these things, not only will it be for you a reward, but if you abstain from prohibition, it will also be a reward. And not only is it all about reward, but I guarantee you that you will benefit in your life to begin with and then in the hereafter. So now when you understand that, you begin to realize why Allah placed rules and regulations. Why Allah placed rules and regulations. Two days ago, someone spoke to me from Nigeria telling me, you know, my husband, he looks at other women. I said, well, does he lower his gaze? He said, no. She said, no, he doesn't. Well, then now you have a little problem because looking at a woman, lowering your gaze thereafter is an act of worship. Subhanallah. I don't mean the initial intentional look, but I mean if you see someone, mashallah, tabarakallah, don't keep that gaze going, 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 subhanallah, and don't say, well, it's the first one, I haven't yet, uh, you know, I haven't dropped it, so the hadith said the first one is for you, the second one is against you. No, you drop it with respect. The, if you believe in Allah and the last day, notice in the hadith, the Prophet says, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, what's the last day all about? Why is it so important to repeat here? Because if you don't believe in reckoning and the last day, it's not going to bother you. You will do things as though there's nothing to come. But if you believe in Allah and the last day, the amount of comfort you get and peace and contentment you get by lowering your gaze for the sake of Allah is unmatched. Wallahi is unmatched. The same applies when you are angry and you want to explode in anger. And Allah says, those who extinguish their anger, those who suppress that anger, and those who forgive people, indeed Allah loves those who do good. Subhanallah. Amazing verse. In fact, it's so amazing because when you forgive people for the sake of Allah, what you feel in you is amazing. Allah says, you want forgiveness, learn to forgive. You have forgiven, I will forgive you, etc. It's so many different ahadith. But when you are angry and you extinguish or suppress the anger for the sake of Allah, the inner comfort you feel is absolutely amazing. However, outwardly also and 
urgently or more importantly immediately you will begin to feel good in your health as well so look at how the instruction of allah came to help you with your akhirah to help you with your contentment the inner person that you are and to help you with your health as well and to help society and community as well this is allah this is allah's instruction and this is why when you do good to someone Remember Allah said in the verse I just read, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who do good. So I do good because Allah loves those who do good. I don't do good because it's a tit for tat thing. You do good, I do good. You do good because I think you deserve the good that I'm about to do. If that's the case, what reward do you want from Allah? When Allah says you do good because I love those who do good. Then I will do good to those even whom I think do not deserve that goodness. But I'm doing it for Allah. That's why the hadith teaches us when you want to do good to someone, firstly correct your intention. Make sure it's for the sake of Allah. Make sure it's for Allah. Once you have that link with Allah, you are smiling. A person swears you, a person mocks at you, they call you names, they call you whatever they want. It's okay. We will still be good to them. Look at the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu When they threw stones at him, when they chased him in Ta'if, he still made a dua to Allah. Allahumma ihdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, guide my people. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. But with us, someone just has to look at you and shake their head a little bit. And you say, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, destroy this person. Oh Allah, break them. Oh Allah. Why? Where is the ihsan? Where is the goodness? It boils down to belief in Allah and the last day. You believe in Allah and the last day you begin to enjoy doing what Allah told you to do. Because you know for a fact that when Allah tells me something to do, I will do it because I'm a believer without questioning it whether I've understood it or not. Surah Al Ahzab, Allah says. It is not for a believing male or female to think that they have a choice regarding that which was instructed by Allah or his messenger. They wouldn't do that. True believers would never question what Allah has instructed. They would believe that by me fulfilling the instruction of Allah, I am actually not only gaining closeness to Allah and the reward and elevation and the forgiveness of sin, but I am helping myself in my contentment, my health, my body, physically, outwardly, and I'm contributing to the purity and the, the, the standard of society and living going up by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a package. And for this reason, the Prophet ﷺ was sent to us. That's why he was sent to us. Because Allah loves us. Allah loves us so much. That he sent a guide for us from amongst us. Allah has definitely favored the believers. With what? When he sent to them a messenger to tell them how he wants to be worshipped, to show them what should be done, what should not be done, to show them what's good for them and what's not. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum say, مَا تَرَكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ خَيْرًا إِلَّا وَدَلَّنَا عَلَيْهِ وَلَا شَرًّا إِلَّا حَذَّرَنَا مِنْهُ There is not a single good thing that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has forgotten to instruct us about and there is not a single bad thing that he has forgotten to warn us about. So much so that he taught us how to clean how to cleanse ourselves after relieving ourselves subhanallah as deep as that so a true believer does not feel for a moment that they have a say if the instruction comes from Allah if the instruction comes from Allah or the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they don't believe they have a say they know I'm gonna do it I will try to understand and mostly I would once or twice in a, on a few instances I may not understand but I will still follow the instruction of Allah because I want happiness I want contentment I want goodness etc etc so that sister going back to the window I opened a little bit earlier on my little laptop that's in front of me right here that sister says my husband looks at other women and I really don't know so I said sister do you know what one of the points I raised you know, through that discussion was 
when we as sisters learn to dress modestly modestly means you know loose clothing not tight fitting loose clothing that is with good material that is not there to show your size your shape etc etc we are valued for who we are because on the globe they can say what they want people are free indeed from a secular perspective to dress the way they want but it comes at a price if you're ready to pay it it's up to you that price may be for those who believe like you and i it's a religious spiritual price my connection with my maker but for those who don't believe sometimes they will still pay a price. It's to do with the community, the, the, the levels of morality and so on. It's to do with what happens and how you as a gender are actually looked at. Because I know people, and this was another discussion that happened here in Nigeria. I know people who have said that they are offered a job in return for sexual favors. And it's happening a lot. May Allah forgive us. I'm sorry to mention it here, but reality needs to be spoken about. If that is the case, don't you fear Allah. Where is man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir? Where is it? Why do we not offer a job on merit? But when someone walks in with a tight jeans so tight that it's about to rip and it might just rip. We offer them a job because we want to see them sitting in our offices. And we want to perhaps fulfill all sorts of other whims and fancies that we have. May Allah forgive us. When you, when you believe in Allah and the last day, it's upon merit that you will employ a person. Forget about whether they are tall or short or dark or thin or not or whatever it may be. It's merit. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us honesty. So what happens is when we dress in a way that is not taught by Allah and His Rasul sallallahu it comes at a price. And then you have people who keep looking and checking and seeing and then they want to touch you know because it starts off with a look if you haven't lowered the gaze and you keep on going what happens next you start saying mm, and then you want to what happens your, your hands want to go my brother relax my sisters take it easy let's understand it comes at a price be respectful and you will earn the honor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you might be thinking how is this connected to your topic let me explain that introduction is extremely important because to know about the night and dua and tahajjud and the Prophet wasallam and the ibadah that he engaged in and taught us, it would be valueless if there's no iman in you. People will say, oh wow, yeah, he was a prophet of Allah. This is what he did. So what? No. When the Prophet wasallam told us to do things, they were for a reason. After Salatul Isha, if you do not have anything constructive to do, go to bed. Early to bed, early to rise. Those sayings we've heard. Islam has taught them to us way back in a way that if you were to do it with the correct intention, you earn a reward. You earn a reward. So the Prophet ﷺ not only taught that to us, he actually practiced upon it. After Salatul Isha, he used to love to recline quite early. And then he would get up early as well. Subhanallah. Look at it. Why recline? Many reasons. If you don't have anything constructive to do, recline. Look, I want to tell you, many of you are married here. Mashallah. For those who are not married, let's hear a loud Ameen. May Allah bless you with the best of spouses. Mashallah. That means quite a few of you are not married as well. But those of us who are married, subhanallah, imagine your spouse coming into bed for a change after Salatul Isha. Allahu Akbar. I think you have to have a walima the next day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. But what happens? We sit doing nothing. I, I've had a meal. Now I've, Salah is over. I'm sitting with my friends with the, with the shisha. You know what's a shisha? People say that's not smoking, so it can't be haram. It's worse. May Allah forgive us. No excuse. Doesn't mean in some countries they've now legalized the weed. So suddenly weed becomes halal. No, it doesn't. The ruling remains the same. Maybe medicinally, yes, there is a lot of benefit perhaps under certain conditions. If the experts were to give you that advice, that's a topic on its own. But we're talking of social weed. They say, ah, oh, weed is allowed. Is it allowed? Okay, right. Let's start weeding. No, no. May Allah forgive us. But remember my beloved brothers and sisters, when the Prophet ﷺ was intimate with his spouse, 
It was an ibadah. He told us, Fi budu'i ahadikum sadaqa. It's wrong to speak about the night of the Prophet ﷺ without learning a lesson. Many people complain, I've been married and you know we haven't been intimate for a month. Wallahi, someone told me, eight years I haven't been intimate. Allahu Akbar. Are you sure? It's not eight days. You're married. For what? Where is the man going? What is he doing? May Allah forgive us. Why do you hold someone if you don't want to be intimate with them? Do it for the sake of Allah, for your own sake. Subhanallah, Allah has kept pleasure in it such that we are engaging in an act of worship and people won't even consider it an act of worship. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were surprised. They said, Ya Rasulallah, you, you know, you're just saying fi ahadikum sadaqa means to fulfill your sexual desires with your spouse is a charity. It's an act of worship. Is that it? He says, yes, it is. Do you see if you were to fulfill that desire in haram, would it be sinful? So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, yes, it would be definitely sinful. Well, then if you do it in halal, it is an act of worship. It is a sadaqa. Subhanallah. So get used to it, my beloved brothers, my those who are married. Remember that your spouses have needs and even the sisters. Your spouses have needs and try to build that relationship such that it's not forced. Rather, it's something good. It's something mutual. It's supposed to be enjoyed by both. And it's something we speak about because the Prophet ﷺ has addressed it. We are not ashamed of addressing that which he has addressed. And it's a, it's a problem in society and community. I only wonder how the brother's translating it in sign language. <laughs> MashaAllah. <laughs> May Allah bless us all. May Allah grant us goodness and ease. So my beloved brothers and sisters, this is a passionate call to say, you know, when we talk of the ibadah of the Prophet Sallallahu we need to remember not only did he engage in it, but he instructed it. So if you're married and you're not intimate with your spouse, you shall be questioned by Allah. You will be caught on the day of judgment. That yawmil akhir we are talking about. Be warned about it. It's just a matter of time before the haq and the truth catches up with you. We don't want that to happen. Learn to have a beautiful relationship. When you have nothing constructive to do after Salatul Isha, the best thing you could do is go and recline. Your spouse has a right. Your body has a right to the sleep, subhanallah. And you know, nowadays medicine is telling you that if you were to sleep early, you would achieve X, Y, and Z. We've been told a long time back, go to sleep early. Maybe the explanations were not made, but Allah speaks to us. Regarding his rules and regulations, we will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves and within themselves until they are convinced that the Quran is the truth. That the instruction of Allah is the truth. That the deen, the religion is the truth. The instructions are beautiful. Nowadays people say, you know what? This rule that Allah has set. Let's take the same one we're talking about, sleeping early. They say, but from a medicinal perspective, from a medical perspective, medical perspective, it's very healthy to sleep early. Oh, then I'm going to sleep early. But when we told you the hadith, you were not bothered. You see? So what happened? Allah just proved to you through medicine that it's healthier. How many of us are ready to do this? You know, I feel like I'm speaking, but I need help myself. Do you know why? Because Wallahi, this phone is a problem. Sometimes we're at home, Wallahi, we're in bed. And we are more distant than we would be had we not been in that bed from our spouses. Because we're busy and we're laughing and we're joking and the spouse looks at you, turns around and then turns the other way and then puts the pillow this way and then hugs the pillow. All those are signs to say, hey, you're supposed to be hugging me here, not the pillow. Subhanallah. It's a reality. But what happens then when the spouse is snoring and suddenly we realize, hey, it's getting late. I'm close. We drop the phone so many times. So many, then we put it aside and go. 
to bed. By that time, people are upset and angry and so on. My brothers, that needs to stop. When you're disciplined, you learn. When you're disciplined, you achieve. You learn what it's all about. You see, you know, subhanallah. So many things come to my mind right now. When you look at Rasulullah sallallahu his life is so beautiful. Every aspect of our lives is covered by the life of Rasulullah sallallahu That's why Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, for you, there is a beautiful example to be followed in that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His life, his ways, his mannerisms, everything to be followed. But for who? Who is going to follow it? And who will be affected by it? You know what Allah says? Whoever believes in Allah, whoever is looking forward to the meeting with Allah, and whoever is looking forward to the hereafter, to the last day, to the day of judgment, goes back to what I said at the beginning. Important. Without that, you're not going to sort your WhatsApp problem out. I remember telling a brother and yesterday one of the brothers sent me a message quite late to say you're supposed to be sleeping subhanallah may Allah bless us I can blame the what can I blame subhanallah I can blame the time difference between where I come from and here subhanallah the jet lag but anyway no excuse the reality is there was a brother I messaged saying my brother you need to be asleep the next day he told me no I have this app where I just appear online all the time. So don't think I'm online. I've never heard of that app. I said, what's that app? I said, I've heard of another app where you appear offline, yet you're online. But this, don't try and fool me. He says, no, there is an app. I said, come on, be serious. He said, yeah, well, I just got to say that. You see, you were telling a lie. To cover what? I'm not even your wife, by the way. <laughs> and you're telling a lie. Imagine what fairy tales you must be saying at home. So to cover one thing, there is another and a third. So let's discipline ourselves. If you cannot control your relationship with your phone, how are you going to be able to develop a relationship with Allah? If you cannot control your relationship with your phone, how are you going to develop a relationship with Allah? Forget about that salah coming into place. We have to start with that salatul isha that we are speaking about. In many cases, we don't even fulfill salatul isha. When the hadith says you read salatul isha with jama'ah, you read salatul fajr with jama'ah, you will have a reward of a person who has stood in worship all night that night. Is it difficult? But the answer is no. It depends on your belief in Allah and the last day. When you are clocking, you know, I'm thinking about something here. We work hard. We work very hard. And we work so hard. If you are to get money for the deals that you engage in and you do more deals right now, if your phone rings and there is a deal worth a million Naira, I think a lot of us would actually get up and say, yes, yes, and walk out and at least do the deal and then come back maybe if we're lucky, right? Because that deal of a million Naira is more important than sitting here in the case of a lot, right? A lot of people, to be honest. But why are we doing it? Because we want to more and more. We want more and more. A million, two million, five million, ten million, twenty million, a hundred million, a billion, two billion, and what else? It keeps on going and going and going. Wallahi, the bank of the Akhirah is more important. Wallahi, the currency of the Akhirah is more important. The deals that you're going to strike with Allah are more important. The currency is the deeds. And the hereafter is the time when you're going to see your bank balance. So be careful because the money you've amassed here will be wasted. But what you amass with Allah is never wasted. Ma in Allah says it loud and clear what you have with yourself is going to go it's going to be completely depleted but what you have deposited with Allah shall remain forever you're going to see it so this is why we say do your salatul isha with jama'ah when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam described the two rakaat of sunnah of fajr do you know what he said do you realize this, the, the, the weight of the statement? He knows that people love wealth. They want to earn. Like I said, if you had to earn a million, a million. For some people, they say, no, a million is a bit too little. But the, the vast majority of us, a million naira is a lot of money. 
So to be honest, what they will say, Subhanallah, well, that's a deal. It's okay. It's halal. It's permissible. I want to let you know, my beloved brothers and sisters, Raka'ata al-fajri khayrum min dunya wa ma fiha. The two units of sunnah of Salatul Fajr are better than the whole world and whatever it contains. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. The whole world and whatever it contains. There are two units of prayer at a certain time that the Prophet ﷺ says in a sahih narration that these are better for you than the whole world and what it contains. I'm not yet talking about the night. We're talking of the beginning and the ending of it only because we're presuming you're asleep in the middle or on WhatsApp. Astaghfirullah. I hope not. So those two raka'at, we will only be able to fulfill them correctly as an act of worship for the sake of Allah, hoping that we will see its reward. Bi'ithnillah. If we discipline ourselves. We believe in Allah and the last day. Learn to sleep early. Take that advice. You will find when you sleep early, your health improves. Your relationships improve. People know you're at home. Subhanallah. Everything else improves. Even those who are younger. When you, are, when you sleep early, wallahi, your health improves. The condition of your heart. I was reading an article recently that, say, that says people who don't sleep on time and they have very erratic sleep. The heart becomes weak. So your lifespan is becoming smaller. Then you have suddenly we become mu'mineen. We say, but my death was written by Allah before I was born. How could that have changed anything? Now you're a mu'min when it suits you. You use iman in order to justify your wrongdoing. Subhanallah. In order to defy what they are telling you. But when it comes to the true message and rule, then you don't want it. Allahu Akbar. Then you are waiting until the day. That whip strikes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May that not happen to us. We don't need to wait for punishment to come down before we change for the sake of Allah. Learn to read your Salatul Isha. Learn to read your Salatul Fajr. On time with pleasure. What is the meaning of with pleasure? With pleasure would distinguish between those who are fulfilling Salah because they have to do it and those who are fulfilling it because they want to do it. When you have to do it, you just do it. Like I said in my speech uh, somewhere uh, a few days ago, perhaps in Maiduguri, where I said, when you have to fulfill your salah and you're doing it only because you have to. Okay, we believe it's compulsory. We believe it's farad. So I do believe I have to. But over and above that, I want to as well. I want to as well. That's, that's why Allah tests you. You read your farad and walk away. Well, you did it because you had to do it. But you read your farad and you added sunnah to it. Now you're doing it because you want to do it. You see the difference? If you read your farad and walk away, perhaps people might say that now you fulfilled your duty. I agree with the statement. You fulfilled your duty. But are you reading salah or fulfilling the salah because you have to or you want to? If you want to, you're going to add a little bit of sunnah. At least two units. Come on. For who? Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal al Alameen. When you're sitting at night with someone haram, you're not supposed to be sitting with them. You love the time. You want to sit all night. But with your maker whom you are in desperate need of to breathe and for the heartbeat that you need 136,000 times a day, you can't spend five more minutes. Allahu Akbar. Five more minutes with Allah. Five minutes with Allah. Two more units. And when you finish that, you say, ah, let me make another two. Allahu Akbar. That is the way a mu'min should be. I love Allah so much. Let me take my time. So I was saying that if you want to know whether you're doing it as a pleasure and an honor, or whether you're doing it just to get done with it, then you need to ask yourself, what do I read in that salah? After Surah Al-Fatiha. There's something called default settings. You know what default settings are? Inna atayna an qul huwallah. Done. Those are default settings. And you're down. And the next unit, Okay, if you're doing it because those are the only two surahs you know, perhaps, mashallah, good. May Allah make it easy for you to learn more. But if you're doing it all the time, then you need to improve the quality of your ibadah. Allah does not need it. Remember, Allah is not poor. Ya ayyuhan nasu antumul fuqara'u ilallah 
Oh people, you are the ones in absolute need of Allah. Totally dependent upon Allah. Allah is absolutely independent. He doesn't need you at all. How can I just read inna atayna and qulhu wallah? When I when I give a gift of let me give you an example. I went to Meduguri. You know what I loved there? The bakhur, the smell. MashaAllah. What do they call it? There's a name to it. MashaAllah. So I asked for it. And MashaAllah, they gave me quite a bit. SubhanAllah. You know, now you can't even ask for things because they'll give you a whole container full. But the point is, it's packed and it's wrapped and it's nice and it looks presentable and so on. Wallahi, when we're giving someone a gift, we want to wrap it, pack it, make it so nice, make it look presentable so that they can accept it from us. You know, they can accept it from us. No one opened my hand and said, open your hand, Sheikh, and put a few drops of the powder and a few cracks here. No, they didn't. They packed it nicely. It's in a jar. The jars are in a box. The box is in another packaging and so on and so forth. You open and you open and you open and it's a gift. So what happens is normally when we give each other's gift, you know what happens to us? The heart of the little children especially is looking forward to that gift to say, wow, and you open one. And then you open it again and then you open another one and you think and then when you see a small little Malteser inside you start thinking gosh what happened here may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us but when you see lovely packaging and then you see something that's of value you appreciate it wallahi you want to package a small gift to a human being in a lovely way package your salah in the most beautiful way Package your salah in the most beautiful way. It is for the supreme deity who doesn't need it at all. Imagine you're a small person giving a huge wealthy man a gift. And he really appreciates it because it's the, it's, the, it's the thought that counts. That's what they say, right? But how you presented it and how you gave it and etc, etc. It means a lot. So with Allah, take your time with salah. That's packaging it. When you say Allahu Akbar, concentrate. And you know what? It is normal for every single one of us without a single exception to lose a little bit of concentration here and there. The, the level of concentration differs from person to person. But our duty is to continue bringing our mind and heart back to it the minute you divert shaitan tries with you you bring it back you know you go you bring it back you bring it keep on bringing it back that is what your salah is all about to try your best to have as much concentration as possible you won't have a hundred percent but you need to have more than what you had yesterday and you need to keep trying and don't let shaitan make you think my salah was a waste of time it was never a waste of time. For as long as it is for the sake of Allah alone and done in conformity to what the Prophet ﷺ has taught, it's not a waste of time. You keep trying and you hope that Allah will accept it because all Allah wants from you is the fact that you tried. That's all. He doesn't need the ibadah. He just needs you to have tried. So your ibadah will never be perfect. But the perfection of Allah is such that he will accept an imperfect ibadah for as long as you tried in accordance with what you were supposed to do. That is Allah. So now what has happened? You fulfill your salah, you try to read a surah, you learn another one. And if you only know those two surahs, at least you read them slowly. You try to learn their meaning. You concentrate and you don't just get your salah done with. I can tell you, I'm also guilty of sometimes without thinking. We say, brother, I'll come. Can I just quickly finish my salah? That word quickly is an insult to Allah. Wallahi, may Allah forgive me. Let me just quickly get done with my salah. We say that word quickly and fast and whatever. Don't worry, I'll just be a minute. How can you say that? It's Allah. It's Allah whom you are dealing with. Come on. Just say, my brother, please wait for me. I'll fulfill my salah. Or you know what? I'm, I'm about to read my salah or fulfill it. Just wait. And then you go and you enjoy. Allahu Akbar. Salli salatam wadda'in. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, read your salah as though it's your last chance to do it. Last chance. Imagine a man holding a gun at your head and saying, right, I'm about to pull the trigger. What would you like to do? Say, give me a chance to read two rakaat. If he says, okay, I don't think that salah is going to end until tahajjud. <laughs> it's a reality. But when sometimes we're about to die and we don't know, but our salah, the last one we would have fulfilled. Subhanallah. What would happen? We want it to be the best one by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
his night has begun, Salatul Isha. He used to spend his time, if there was something important, the matters of the ummah, certain matters of concern, something constructive. Yes, he didn't sleep early. He dealt with those things and then he reclined. When he reclined, obviously, there were the adhkar. The adhkar meaning the remembrance of Allah. We're in the evening, we're about to go to bed. Your whatever adhkar you would know. You make dua to Allah, you call out to Allah. You, you, there is a beautiful dua that the Prophet ﷺ used to make when he used to recline, when he was about to go to sleep. Because a portion of the night dedicated to the family. Remember that, to your spouse, in the case of those who are married. That, like I explained, is an ibadah, act of worship. But when you are going to sleep, the Prophet ﷺ says, you know, there are two or three different duas, but the one I'm going to mention now, is the one where the Prophet ﷺ, he used to make a dua not only for that sleep, but he used to make a dua for if you take me away during my sleep, have mercy on me. You're going to take my soul away. If you're going to take it away, have mercy on it. And if you're going to release it, then protect it the way you protect those who are pious. Ibadah ka salihin means those worshippers of yours who are pious. In amsakta nafsi faghfir laha wa in arsaltaha fahfadha bihifdika alladhi tahfadhu bihi ibadah ka salihin. Bismika Allahumma wada'atu jambi wa bika arfa'uha. Your name, O oh Allah. In your name, I recline, I put my side down. I lie down in your name. And in your name, I shall bring it up. Meaning when I get up, it's with your name. When I recline, it's with your name. If you have taken me away during my sleep, have mercy on me. If you have held back that soul, and if you release it and you give me life for another day, protect me, O oh Allah. What a beautiful dua. How many of us go to sleep? We didn't make a dua. I want you to answer the question within yourself. How many of us go to sleep without making a dua? Inshallah, we change that. We change that. Call out to Allah. Look at this beautiful dua. Bismik Allahumma wada'atu jambi. Wa bika arfa'uha. In amsakta nafsi, faghfir laha. Wa in arsaltaha, fahfadha. Bihifdika alladhi tahfadhu bihi ibadaka salihin. I've already translated it. What a beautiful dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We sleep, we thank Allah. And we get up, inshallah, early enough. If we were to follow the exact footsteps of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam for a salah known as tahajjud, what is tahajjud? Let me explain. ينزل الله تبارك وتعالى في السماء الدنيا كل ليلة حين يبقى ثلث الليل الأخير فيقول هل من تائب فأتوب عليه وهل من مستغفر فأغفر له وهل من سائل فأعطيه Every night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest heavens and He calls out, calling out, saying, what does He say? He says, who is there seeking forgiveness? At a time when the third of the night remains, who is there seeking forgiveness so I can forgive? Who is there repenting so I can accept? Who is there asking me any of their needs so that I can give? If you look carefully at that hadith, there is no precondition of having fulfilled tahajjud or having read salah. It's an open invitation from Allah to say, you want to seek forgiveness? Here I am. You want to repent? Here I am. You want to ask me anything? Here I am. I know of people who set their clocks for the time of tahajjud, even if, even if, subhanallah, they haven't fulfilled the tahajjud, but they will get up and call out to Allah, feeling the presence that, you know what? I can, this call is from Allah, yaqeenan. There is no doubt that Allah is calling. Imagine when you get up and you can actually look at the time and say, wow, Allah is calling. Allah is calling me. Oh Allah, I am the one. I am seeking. Oh Allah, me. I want forgiveness. Oh Allah, forgive me. I have a need. I'm calling out to you. I know that you're, you're here to answer me. Call out to Allah. He will give you what you want. If it is tawbah and istighfar, he will forgive you. If it is anything else, he will grant it to you when he knows it's the right time. He will give you what he knows is better for you. Subhanallah. So this is the time of tahajjud. That is the most blessed time of the night. It's the early hours of the morning we call it, right? 
The, the last part of the night is the time of the Hajjud, its splendor, its goodness, its greatness. Meaning the value of that night is not based on the Tahajjud, but it's the night itself, the fact that Allah is calling out and Allah descends to the lowest heaven. So now you need to know something. We will call out to Allah, but we will also engage in Ibadah. Ibadah meaning acts of worship. Call out to Allah. I need to thank Allah, praise Allah, subhanallah. So there are few things you should do and could do. Number one, dhikrullah, the praise of Allah, the remembrance of Allah. The Quran is part of dhikrullah. You can read the Quran. It's a blessed time. Subhanallah, you would actually be encouraged to engage in Salatul Tahajjud with units of two, two, two. Salatul Layli, Mathna, Mathna. The Prophet ﷺ says that the, the Salah of the night is read in twos. So we read them in twos. That's the recommended, the proper way of doing things. So you read them in twos, but on condition that you are doing it with your whole heart, no rush at all and you do it for the sake of Allah at that juncture and at that time when you put your head on the ground in sujood for the sake of Allah you are actually the closest you could ever be to Allah Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu li rabbihi wa huwa sajid the closest that a slave can be to his Lord is when he is in prostration you know, when you want to look at the value of prostration, ask yourself, would I ever put my, he my head down in that condition in front of a king or a, or a person or a, or a monument or a statue? Absolutely not. Never. Worship is for Allah and Allah alone. So that's why no matter how big I may be, how wealthy, how powerful, how healthy, how, how many kids and grandkids and great grandkids I have, but I am nothing but a slave of Allah, the Lord of the worlds. I will drop in sujood for the sake of Allah. تَتَجَافَى جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَبَاجِئِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا Surah Sajda speaks about those who forsake their beddings at night in order to worship Allah. Allah praises them and tells them, for you is Jannah. Jannah. You really believe in the last day. Because to worship Allah at night, nothing will inspire you unless you really believe in Allah and the last day. We have problems. We want solutions to our problems. At one stage, I tried asking people who came to me to say, I have a problem. And I tell them, did you call out to Allah in the last third? So many people used to say no, that I stopped asking. I just used to inform them, try calling out to Allah. Imagine we're saying, try calling out to Allah. What try? You're supposed to start off by calling out to Allah. If you have, if you have a problem and you haven't made tahajjud or you haven't called out to Allah at the time of tahajjud and you are going to seek solution elsewhere, you've lost the plot. You've lost the plot. It's Allah. Allah has the solution to your problem. Allah has everything. And you haven't yet called out to Him and you're coming to me and to others to help you to resolve a matter when Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal was not called out to. Where is your ibadah of the night? You need it. Subhanallah. May Allah guide us. So when we speak of Rasulullah I guarantee you and I'm telling you he did not need to call out every day and to make dua and istighfar. He was not a person who was sinful at all. But he did it so that we could follow that example. Here we are claiming to be the lovers of Muhammad Wasallam. How many of us have read Salatul Tahajjud in the last 30 days? 30 days gone by. You haven't even read Tahajjud. Brother says, I get up, but because I need a bath, you know, I feel lazy. What? How could you say that? How could you do that? Subhanallah. When you were intimate with your spouse, it was nice. You enjoyed it, right? Remember, the bath is part of the package. Allahu Akbar. May Allah help us. It should be an honor. But I'm shy. You know, people will hear the water at that time of the night. They know what happened at night. 
How can you say that for the sake of Allah? Teach your children and your family members there's nothing wrong. They need to know when they grow up that I will shower. So what if everyone in the house knows what happened? It was a sadaqa. Let it, let it be. Allahu Akbar. We are shy of halal and we are not shy when it comes to haram. How many men are aware of the girlfriends of their friends, but they cover up when it comes to their wives? Why? Because a lot are guilty. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So to have that shower, I'm saying a shower, but we're talking of a ghusl. At that time of the night, for the sake of Allah, is an ibadah. Remember that. It's an act of worship. How many of you, or how, let's word it differently, how many of us would miss Salatul Fajr with the excuse of I need a shower? A'udhu Billah. Where are we? Where is the Prophet Sallallahu Wallahi, I want to end off by telling you something very, very powerful. Do you not agree that the Prophet Sallallahu was the best of creation, the most noble of all Prophets of Allah? We agree. Allah loved him more than everything else, more than everyone else. Allah says to him, Tabarak al-lazhi insha'a ja'ala laka khayran min thalika jannatin tajri min tahtiha al-anhaar wa yaj'al laka qusura. When the kuffar of Quraysh used to look at him and say he's a poor man, etc., etc. Allah says, you know what? Glory be to he whom, if, I, if he willed, he could have given you much more than everything they have. He could have given you palaces beneath which would be rivers flowing. And he would have given you castles. But that's not what the dunya is all about. The pleasure of Allah is not determined by what material assets he may have bestowed upon you. Never. Allah loved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than you and I, but never allowed him or did not let him sit on an aircraft. There was a burak way beyond an aircraft, way beyond an aircraft. He didn't have a phone, but he was loved by Allah more than you and I. He didn't have electricity, loved more than you and I. He didn't have a tap, loved more than you and I, where there was running water. He didn't have electricity. They lit fires. He didn't have a motor vehicle. They rode animals. They walked in the desert. No air condition, no fan, no electricity. But Allah loved him definitely more than all of us put together. Have you thought of that? And you and I far away, but we drive our luxury vehicles nice air condition, beautiful phones. The Prophet ﷺ didn't have iPhone, no phone at all, no video call, no nothing at all. Allah loved him more than all of us put together. But Allah did not want that for him. If Allah wanted it for him, Allah would have given it to him much more than anything we have had. Allah would have blessed him. Allah blessed him definitely, but not with technology because this is not a sign of the happiness of Allah. For water, they didn't have a tap. They used to go out. They used from the wells, from the rivers, etc., etc. What else? From the streams. They used to get water. They didn't have fridges. They didn't have cold water as we have today from the sources we have. But I can tell you something. They made wudu with much more love and much more connection to Allah than we make. Yet for us, it's just a tap. We can condition the temperature of that water, but we still don't make wudu. They bathed with a little amount of water from a bucket, but we have a shower, we have a bath tub, and we still don't bathe. And we have pumps and we have everything for water to come out of a tap. Do you not fear Allah? Do you not fear Allah? Subhanallah. We have technology, we don't even use it. Look, we don't go to the masjid when they used to have the heat of the desert and they used to walk to the masjid. We have air conditioned vehicles and we don't go to the masjid. We have loudspeakers. 
We have so much in terms of technology. Remember, don't be lazy to worship Allah. Whatever you have, whatever you have is a test from Allah. Allah wants to see whether you're going to use it in his pleasure or displeasure. Your social media accounts, whether you use them in the pleasure of Allah or displeasure, that is the test. May Allah forgive me and all of us and may Allah strengthen us to be able to use all of this in a way that we do not forsake that which we are meant to be engaged in such as our salah. We don't need to worship Allah all night, every night. Yes, in Ramadan, the night of the Prophet ﷺ was different. He used to spend all night in ibadah. But that was different with us where we can, we are on a different level. The minimum is fulfill your farah. That which is your duty, compulsory, do that at least, and Allah will open your doors. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us and open our doors. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly grant me a lesson from what I've said. And inshallah, every one of us, I hope that we can put into practice a lot of these points I've raised I have tried to keep them as practical as possible as real as possible so that we can put them into practice in our lives if we're not going to change our lives we wasted our money time effort and energy gathering here today if your life is going to change there was a purpose for you to come here today it will be accepted by Allah it will be a blessed gathering by the will of Allah. But if you came, you go back, oh, it was nice, good talk, we did this, we did whatever. Yesterday, I was speaking to some of the brothers and sisters and I said, you know what? We've got to be selfless and we've got to be selfless. If you attended here just to take a selfie, unfortunately, you lost the plot. You've got to be selfless as well, which means, yes, we may be happy. We may want to encourage others by showing them on social media what happened, post a clip or two, etc., etc. But your main purpose of coming here is to change yourself for the sake of Allah. If you haven't been moved by what was said all day by these scholars coming from across the globe and the local scholars, etc., etc., then surely we've wasted our time. May Allah help us improve ourselves, help us correct our intentions, I want to say my brothers and sisters earlier when I said I've been let down by Abuja, I didn't mean it. I must clear it, inshallah. I just wanted you to respond a little bit louder. So it's been bothering me ever since that time. So I thought before I end, I'll just clear it with you to say, I love you, Abuja. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu.